Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. I've always been fascinated by the meaning of words and especially the history behind them. Frequently, there is a much story, a deeper story within words themselves and we actually realize a story that is sometimes completely lost in the modern day use of a word. My favorite and perhaps most telling example of this is the word Luddite. Today we use the word as a pejorative for someone who is scared of technology or is uncomfortable or just not good with technology. In fairness, sometimes we also use it playfully, but it's never necessarily a positive thing. But what is lost in our everyday use of the word is its very deep and consequential history. The Luddites were workers and artisans in the early 19th century who rebelled against factory owners who used machines to increase their own profits at the expense of the workers. It was a movement that became quite popular in its day and a movement that was brutally put down, making it even more peculiar that the meaning of the word has almost become lost in our modern day usage of it. Today we're going to be in conversation about this history. My guest is Brian Merchant. Brian Merchant is a veteran technology columnist and writer and journalist, and he is the author of the book, Blood in the Machine, The Origins of the Rebellion Against Big Tech. Brian Merchant, it's my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. This story about the Luddites, it's firmly, it, it, it's in the early 19th century, in other words, early 1800s, sort of beginning around 1811, 1812. We'll get more specific into years in a moment, but this is firmly the time of what we consider to be in the Industrial Revolution. What, what is happening in the world <clears throat> with machines in the early 1800s? Yeah, in the early 1800s, you know, the biggest thing that's happening with machines is, you know, there have been some advancements and across the 18th century in the preceding um, decades, there have been advancements um, in the uh, ability for machines to produce large quantities of uh, of product or to uh, do tasks more efficiently. Um, but more importantly, uh, and 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 this is what often gets overlooked is the machines are being organized into factory like settings, right? They're being um, uh, set up so that the labor can be divided um, and operated under an overseer or a factory boss or an owner. Um, and so you have changes to the machinery itself, that is, it's getting more productive, and then you have sort of a, a particular sort of subset or class emerging class of, of 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 person who is seeking to sort of capture those productivity gains for himself um or for you know a, a, a relatively small uh, group of people whereas previously a lot of these machines had been used in various uh, capacities, um, but under the control of, of, a, of a single uh, master weaver or in a small shop that you know any that people were you know working on uh, unequal footing. Um, so yeah, right about that time, you have this this uh, this sort of this divergence both in the mode of economic production and you have this sort of uh, accelerating uh, technological productivity um, at that time as well. Um, so that's when you start to see great disruption to the lives of the of the workers who are more than anything accustomed to what was called the domestic system of output, where you have a cottage industry. It's the oh, these weavers and um, cloth workers who made up the largest industrial base of England's workforce besides mm. uh, agricultural workers. So this is so, huge. This yeah, is huge. it's huge. Hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and so when you have this relatively small subset of uh, uh, factory owners and aspiring factory owners start to use this machinery, um, 
It is a direct threat to that way of life. It's a direct um, and immediate economic threat because all of a sudden these little factories and proto factories and mini factories can um, work much more efficiently than than one person at home. But they're also producing worse goods uh, because usually what you do is you get some of these new machines that uh, that can speed up the production, uh, but then you need a, a that someone still needs someone to run it, but you you know want to get somebody who's cheaper than a, a skilled artisan because otherwise that cut into your profits. So you get a child or a migrant worker or an unskilled laborer to come and um, you know work the machines. So you really have you know not what we think of as sort of displacement by automation. These jobs aren't disappearing; they're just being transferred from skilled workers to unskilled ones. For the profit of the the person who owns the machines, and then this makes a lot of people angry. Uh, people who've worked in this field for a long time see their wages calamitously uh, decline, um, and and then you see uh, you know social unrest brewing. So that's what's happening uh, among the the workforce of the of, you know of, in, in England uh, around the turn of the century there. And people recognize what's happening. And I, I found it fascinating in your introduction, you, you write that even a couple of hundred years before this, people could see the danger of machine. There, there was a creation, I think it was called a stocking frame, uh, that they tried to get uh, Queen Elizabeth, so this is like around 1600 or so, uh, to, to give a license to, but she rejected it because she was like, something like this is going to it's going to upend normal society because it's going to put people either out of work or it's going to transform work. Yeah. Yeah. That was the stocking frame. That was the first, um, what you could argue is sort of the first machine that really kind of starts the slow roll of the industrial revolution. Um, and yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the potential of these machines to workers is, and was uh, immediately obvious. Uh, same thing with uh, the power loom when when Edmund Cartwright um, sort of invents uh, or sets out to try to invent um, the machine that will eventually mechanize the process of, of weaving, which for a long time, even in the early Industrial Revolution, was thought too complicated to do. He sets out to try to do it, and he sends it to Manchester where there's a lot of, you know, cotton workers and says, Hey, sends it to some workers and say, Hey, you know, help me, help me figure out how to do this. Like you guys are the experts. I, I, I don't know how to do it. And they, they just said, no, we know what, we know what this means. If you, if you fix this, if you get this thing to work, uh, we don't, we don't want any part of that because what you're going to do is you're going to use it to try to, uh, automate, you know, the, the process of weaving and you're going to try to, uh, benefit from the machine at our expense. Yeah. The Luddites are named after a figure by the name of Ned Ludd. Um, Ned Ludd, is he a fictional character? Yeah, he's, it's, we can't say for sure. You know, the record keeping is imperfect and it's, um, you know, uh, sort of lot, you know, as we'll probably talk about, this was a very sort of, uh, secret society by you know necessity um so you, you can't say for sure but it sure seems like it's apocryphal that it was that it that it, this was a figure who was um made up uh for the for the benefit of of these um these these organizers be because what happens as those conditions have worsened by around 1811 or so um they're not just bad they're intolerable to a lot of people um so you have a we have there's there's a there's a big um crop failure so the harvests aren't good you have taxes that have been ratcheted up to pay for the war against napoleon that uh, that the um that the the british uh government has been uh, pursuing for for years and years now and it's everybody's tired of it they're sick of it um and then there's a trade embargo that cuts off exports of cloth goods so now the trade is falling and then into this vacuum those 
sort of early entrepreneurs use this opportunity to try to buy up more automated machinery, just as we might uh, imagine them doing today when there's trade is at a weakness. They use this as a point of leverage to try to capture more market share with their machinery, thus putting more and more skilled workers out of jobs. And finally, their backs are against the wall in 1811. These workers they rise up um, and they they begin this campaign that's very organized, very strategic, very tactical um, and very forceful where they, uh, you know, threaten factory owners to who have the machines that are taking their jobs uh, with a visit from Ned Ludd. And as you said, Ned Ludd is this apocryphal figure who, you know, say it out loud next to Robin Hood, Ned Ludd, Robin Hood. Uh, this movement sort of begins in 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 and around Nottingham, the stomping grounds of Robin Hood. So there's this rich tradition of dissent um, and and this folklore uh, sort of heroic element. Well, it's and, interesting the connection between Robin Hood and, and Ned Ludd. Yeah, Nottingham, yeah, Sherwood yeah, Forest. Forest. Yeah, there's it's by, by Sherwood Forest, and and the legend goes that Ned Ludd was a young. Uh, was a young stocking uh, frame knitter who was apprenticing um, and his master thought that he wasn't working hard enough so he brought him to the village magistrate who had him whipped for being uh, for not being productive enough and Ned Ludd was a kid who uh, or a young young man who was uh, uh, not inclined to take that well, so he picked up a hammer and he smashes his master's machine and he flees into Sherwood Forest, where he starts to gather an army of like-minded, uh, 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 oppressed uh, men, oppressed by by the u- exploitative use of machinery. So he so this band of uh, Ned Ludd's army become the Luddites uh, and they are not at the time mocked or scorned for being backwards looking as they as the word might indicate today they were uh, fierce folk heroes um, as they go about this campaign where somebody will send a threatening letter to a factory owner and say if you don't take down your machines you'll get a visit from Ned Ludd's army and if they don't take them down sure enough under the cover of night they will get a visit from men who are organized kind of like uh an army regiment or a platoon might be organized they'll hold up the overseer at gunpoint and they march into the factory with giant hammers and they smash the offending machines just the machines that are automating the work that used to be done by by men that just the machines that are violating the social contract just the machines that are sort of disrupting the, the the way of life. The other machinery, the other implements, the other tools, they can stay. And if, as they leave, they tend to say something like, if you bring back the machines, you'll get another visit and this time we'll do the whole place. So they get off with a warning and this sort of symbolic smashing of the machine that's sort of, you know, this the machine is specifically it. You know, it is both actually you know producing profits for for the employer at their expense. So they're achieving a tactical end and smashing this thing. But it's also symbolic, right? These are the machines that are accelerating the imbalance between uh, you know the rich and the poor in England at the time. So by smashing this machine, they're sending this gesture, um, and that's the kind of thing that makes them so popular. Along with their sort of daring, it's a time when uh, you know, the, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and some to see somebody standing up for uh, the working man is immensely popular. So Ned Ludd gets songs written about him, uh, hymns and, and, and poems, and he gets embraced by the romantic poets. And uh, it's 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 really becomes quite a popular movement. Um, and it is based on this sort of fierce and strategic uh goal which is to just dismantle the machinery that is quote hurtful to commonality not all machines it's not unthinking it's very strategic it's very um very sort of uh well organized and well oiled uh so to speak so it 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 is it's far from a knee-jerk reactionary um dunderheadedness they have selected their targets with care and they're sending a message and about what happened the way that they think machinery should be used in society um and people respond it was very popular it had to be stamped out by force by the state a lot lot there i want to unpack we we do have some people who were luddites who we we know were real people uh 
two two names I'm going to ask you about that, that come up frequently in your book, George Meller and Grosvenor Henson. Who, who were they? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in, in, in the book, I take a sort of a, an individual-based approach. I try to drill down into some of the real people um, and kind of tell the story through their eyes as, as much as possible so we get a sense of what was really animating them. Um, and George Mellor was uh, maybe, he's the best known Luddite who was definitely a Luddite um, who w- led his band of, uh, they're called croppers and, and they had a, a specific job which was to sort of finish cloth they would take these enormous shears it was extremely difficult and extremely skilled work so they'd take these enormous shears and sort of once the cloth had already been produced um with by the machinery it's usually produced with this coarse um sort of it's not it's it's not finished it's still rough to the touch um and it's not suitable to be worn say as like a sweater or whatever so they take these giant shears and they, you can look at pictures of them. That it's hard to do them justice because they weigh fifty pounds, and they, and they, and they, sort of run the shears over the over the cloth to finish it off or to smooth it off. And they're called cloth finishers or croppers. They're some of the more um, sort of powerful cloth work. They, their job is so important. If they do a good job, it makes a really nice garment. If they tank it, then the whole thing's ruined. So it's really important you have a good good cropper. And there is a new machine. That was uh, that was gonna start, you know, doing their job, the shearing frame, um, and so they organized uh, into some of the fiercest bands of luddites and took on some of the most daring actions. And his story is um, recorded in an in an oral history and also a novel uh, that was sort of a historical novel based on real interviews. So we have a good sense of him, um, but he's done a duty you know done a tour of duty in in the war against napoleon um he has spent seven years apprenticing as a as a as a proper and he gets to his job and within just a couple of years uh there are factory bosses trying to organize these machines to wipe out his trade in in total um again it's that's the crucial part of the element. The community didn't agree to this. They didn't say, oh, this would be great if we had this and we could all sort of do this for cheaper. In this case, it really is a couple of guys from out of town setting up big factories outside town, trying to get a bunch of these mechanical implements, and then they just get to decide the new configuration of how technology is going to be used because they have money, because they have power, because they have influence, and then they get to impose this new paradigm on the community. And to George and a lot of the other croppers, it just fe- it's it, it feels like they're just stealing their work. They're stealing away their livelihood. It's not a democratic process. It's uh, by force, and it looks like theft. They call it they're stealing our bread. So George uh, <clears throat> becomes a uh, sort of after you know starts in Nottingham. He's up in Huddersfield, which is in uh, west sort of the West Riding of Yorkshire. Um, so the north, there's a whole sort of region called the Luddite Triangle, and it spans Nottingham up to sort of the Leeds area in in uh, in York, and then over to Manchester and Lancashire and and Leicestershire, where there's a, a, a that's kind of encompasses the whole. It's the whole Midlands ish of of uh, England that that becomes a hub for Luddite activity, and he's up there kind of in the north. So he you know he becomes a for better, you know, uh, for our purposes, he becomes a general lud. He's the he's the sort of local leader. Um, there may have been others, but he's definitely one of them. And then he winds up leading the most famous failed luddite raid on a huge factory called Rawfold's Mill. Um, that winds up a, f- a failure, and they get turned away in a hail of gunfire. A bunch of luddites die, and that's one of the turning points in the luddite struggle. So he's a real, you know, sort of militant. Uh, labor leader uh, who's who's doing what you know uh, the historian Eric Hobsham would call uh, collective bargaining by riot, um, and he is uh, actually out there with the hammers and and leading folks uh, through the to the factory doors in under the cover of night. Um, Gravener Henson, who you mentioned, um, 
again, not in, not conclusive. We don't have a, but he was probably a Luddite too. By he was probably out there with the hammer too. But he's more famous for uh, being a sort of a reformer. He while the Luddite activity swells up, and again, this is probably by design. We don't know for sure, but it's there's there are the Nottingham Luddites who are smashing a device called the wide frame that was mechanizing the production of of um, of, of knitted goods, like especially hose, um, and it was doing just a really lousy job of it. it. The wide frame would make two pieces of cloth that you then stitch together, and of course they they fall apart. Where a skilled knitter would make hose, you know, in one consecutive tube all the way up, um, and it would mu last much longer. But the wide frames could churn it out stuff for very cheap, and then all of a sudden that pushed down prices for the product in general. And now the knitters who were already suffering had to compete on price with that. Uh, and so it was a huge problem. Um, and Gravener Henson <coughs> starts, he's uh, 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 slightly unusual for some of the uh, the working men at the time. He's a good writer, he's, he's literate, and he's um, a, also a very tactical mind in a different sense where he starts agitating for reform, gathering petitions, trying to push for laws. Meanwhile, probably while well, that's by day and then by night, he's probably out there, you know, helping to organize the Luddite uh, campaigns around Nottingham where they're actually smashing the machines as a means of putting pressure on um legislators and, and reformers to, to pass laws because it was not a democracy at the time. You couldn't just make your case. You had to make it quite forcefully. Um, so Gravener takes that end. Uh, really, really interesting guy. Um, the the great British historian E.P. E. P. Thompson um, so, uh, has designated uh, Gravener Henson as one of just three or four men who are most crucial to sort of the uh, formation of the modern sort of um, uh, working class movement for for doing a, a lot to sort of you know expand class consciousness through his writings, through his agitating, through his Luddite campaign, um, and and what E. P. Thompson ultimately argues is that the Luddites are one of the sort of cataclysmic events in getting sort of the working class. To think of itself as a working class, to 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 experience solidarity, to say, "Hey, we're all in this together," because it wasn't just the cloth workers; it was also steel workers, coal workers, shoemakers, artisans of every stripe who recognized the general trends and the ways that the winds were blowing and the ways that machines were be using, even if they weren't getting used against them yet. They recognized the way that these uh, forces were taking shape, and it was all in an effort to squeeze them, the artisan, the working guy. So they were out there with the Luddites uh, raiding factories and marching in the streets as well. And that's something that puzzled authorities at the time. They'd say, hey, you're a steel worker. Why would you be out there in the streets? You're, you're going to benefit from the Industrial Revolution. And the steel worker would say, not if it happens like this. Not if it happens where just a handful of guys at the top running their machines get to take the profits for themselves and then we stay at the bottom and we stay squeezed, uh, being forced into these working structures where we have to work for the man. You know, they, they, they understood. They weren't dumb. So they were fighting with the Luddites to try to prevent that formation from taking root. Um, and it did result ultimately sort of in, uh, you know, in ensuing decades, um, it, you know, it was, it should be noted that at the time organizing officially, like you forming a, a combination at the time was, was what it was called is illegal. It was against the law. There are these things called the combination act. So technically if you tried to form a union, uh, you could be thrown in jail. Um, and it was not until well after the Luddite movement sort of inspired the working classes to get together and to call for change that those laws were overturned. Um, and that's, you know, one of the legacies of the Luddite movement for sure. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Brian Merchant. Brian Merchant is the author of the book Blood in the Machine, The Origins of the Rebellion, against big tech you could read his writings online at bloodinthemachine.com 
Brian Merchant, tell me about the pop. This was a popular movement. These weren't just some cranks. <laughs> Again, getting sort of getting back to this modern yeah. day usage of the term Luddite. But 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 what's also fascinating? It had had big, prominent, well known supporters. People like the the Lord Byron, the the right. the poet, and I think he was also a member of Parliament. Um, Percy yeah. Shelling, uh, 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 Mary Shelley. Uh, who wrote Frankenstein, and I, I think that's probably significant because I think Frankenstein's the first great modern book we have about technology. Yeah, yeah, no, they were, you know, they were quite popular at the time, as I as I mentioned in the sort of the folkloric strain. Like they did have people coming out in the streets. There's a while there where uh, even certain officials uh, would, you know, after it was. They were successful doing by night they sort of switched to just kind of you know doing their raids by day and sometimes town officials uh would come out and just kind of watch and what because they they also thought that their their actions were just um they they were sort of cheered you know by crowds who would watch them taking part in these raids and and smashing the machines again because it was just so well understood the way that the machine was being used it wasn't that they were just smashing machines that people didn't understand and yeah smash them no it was understood what was happening and who was benefiting and who was profiting and at the expense of whom so the state couldn't let that go on so or in its eyes anyways right so they started mobilizing troops they started passing laws that made it a crime punishable by death to break machinery they started to mount up you know the uh, very uh, authoritarian response um and in response to that the young poet uh lord byron who was a lord uh he well, he his Newstead Abbey, where which was his estate, his family estate, was up right next to uh, Nottingham, just north of Nottingham, um, and so he had seen this all firsthand. He saw how he saw first of all he saw the conditions of the working people and how much suffering they endured before they took to this uh, to, to these extremes. He knew. Also, that they had spent ten years, and I should have mentioned this earlier, probably, but the but the weavers and the cloth workers, they starting in the very first years of the of the new century, they started peacefully petitioning for reform. They gathered signatures. They said, "Hey, we need a minimum wage. We need some protections. We need some, um, you know, some the barest, uh, you know." semblance of a, of support from from the state if this if all these things are just going to happen to us at once you know if you're gonna you know tax us for the war if you're gonna uh allow you know these new machine owners to come in and and, and to take our our work or to you know compete with us if there's gonna if you're gonna put a trade sanction on our biggest export market which was the united states they they banned them from doing business with the united states because the united states was allied with france in, in the war at the time so if you're gonna do all that then they said you got to give us some some sort of support and they got laughed out of parliament they said no way you know the free hand of the market must must speak we can't do anything to preference anybody so for 10 years they tried to fight peacefully before they finally uh, you know, were pushed into such conditions of of, of such wretchedness and and such desperation that they that they formed this this Luddite response, um, and Byron had seen all that, so he was staunchly on the side of the cloth workers, and he in fact delivers his very first um, speech to the House of Lords. All lords are expected to make speeches. He gives his very first speech in defense of the Luddites as they're trying to make it a crime punishable by death to break a machine. And he really lays into the state. He gives this thundering sort of, um, you know, well written, very maybe too well written because it's like very showy and he's just kind of, you know, and people and you know, very few people actually take it seriously. He's so young and he's already starting to become a literary celebrity. So, you know, it's it's very um sort of play like. But it, it regardless, it just it endures as the most famous um sort of speech in in defense of the luddites in the at the time it was by far the the most powerful pro luddite um uh, sort of work and he he continues to he continues to publish poems in the newspapers mostly anonymously <clears throat> um 
and 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 he sort of really you know gives his support to 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 the luddites that way same with percy shelley who is not yet famous but is becoming famous and he's even more of a luddite supporter he actually has his wife send money to the to the luddites um after when they're in, in in financial trouble later later in the luddite saga um and yeah uh after the after the luddite m- movement well it's still in the middle of uh, the luddism really goes on from 1811 to 1819 i in the book i really focus on the first three years of the movie it's the most sort of explosive the most momentous and it's the and and, and a lot of the 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 main luddites uh who, who who we talk about that it that their sort of um involvement can be contained to that period but it goes on until 1819 in fits and starts and there are some more movements and it's something that um the british state has to deal with until then um and so mary shelley is writing frankenstein in in 1815 or so and you know by then she's uh married to percy shelley who is a huge luddite supporter she had grown up in london while this is all going on her formative years um her father is an intellectual who uh, one of the first anarchists um and he uh sort of inspires her as you know, to think about things in a different in, in a different way um and and she and her mom's mary wollstonecraft who and her mom's mary wollstonecraft feminist the, the, and mm-hmm. the, the, yeah talk about those those parents and then she spends some time up with um these these radical egalitarians up in scotland so she has this really formative and she just you know her writing early on she's just amazing um she's just a a, a very natural evocative and a quite gifted obviously writer um and so she carries with her all these things and she writes frankenstein in um you know the the latter half of the 1810s and revises it just as the uh last luddites are 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 being hung and it doesn't explicitly mention luddism of course but it's all about a reckless man who builds technology for his own glorification and benefit and then turns his back on the results so a lot of scholars have argued that it's uh, uh you know among many uh one of the primary metaphors she's drawing on is the use of technology and the luddite revolt against it in uh in in, in that in that decade um and it does sort of stamp this very early critique of you know reckless use of of powerful technologies that we may not fully understand but the thing that gets lost in a lot of modern day l- translations of, of frankenstein is that her monster was very intelligent was you know was it was not just that it, that that he was created and then went on a rampage and it's you know it's like oh no like you know dr frankenstein did a bad thing and then he tampered with forces he didn't understand and then all hell broke loose no in 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 the original frankenstein uh the the monster is in t- very intelligent and all he wants is to be taken care of he wants companionship he wants his creator to try to level with him and to spend time with him but his creator is just disgusted with him and time and again rejects him spurns him flees you know neglects him and all you know to these entreaties so that then and then the monster embarks on this campaign of of vengeance to try to force him to 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 take care of him decided to either build him a companion so that he's not you know painfully alone basically satisfy his social conditions and dr frankenstein refuses you know he victor frankenstein uh you know you know just abandons him um so it's much more of a of a sort of a, a fitting parable to what was happening with the the luddites and the working classes at the time especially because you know as sympathetic as the romantics were they were all from sort of you know privileged and wealthy households a lot of and then they they did still have sort of this like paternalistic kind of uh, impulse when they're looking at uh you know like oh the the, you know the poor you know working man and you know they've 
they're, they're they've uh, been done wrong by by these mighty entrepreneurs, these might, mighty Frankenstein's. But but still, uh, yeah. it's very significant that they. Um, that they did sympathize, that they did write these works it's, that sort of... It, it's interesting to me. Yeah. It's interesting to me how, how Frankenstein, both the word Frankenstein and Luddites changed in time. Yeah. Because you're right. We, when you think of Frankenstein, you think of a monster. But of yeah. course, Frankenstein was the name of the doctor. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and this creation was, as you said, this, this very sympathetic, you know, in many ways, very sympathetic creature, which you get if you read the book. But yeah. you don't get that necessarily in the in the movies, or you know, uh, we think of Frankenstein as the monster himself. Yeah, yep, yeah. I, you know, I think that it's interesting. So with the Luddites, the word I, a lot of work had to be done to make sure that the that the Luddites were uh, remembered in ignominy. Right? They had to. It was the state who, from day one started publishing these pamphlets, started putting out rewards, started describing the Luddites uh, as these, you know, these these backwards looking people who had fallen under the uh, malign influence of some, you know, dark, you know, force, some, some, some leader. And they, it was this very, this kind of, they know not what they do. Otherwise they wouldn't be smashing the machines that are their job. Can't they see that they smash the machines and they're going to have nothing to, they're going to have no, no machines to work. Um, and it, it, you know, it really, the predators they used all these words that sort of in, indicated that they were sort of dumb barbarians and the unwashed mash, masses kind of, um, and, you know, it was sort of it, 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 kind of a it, even battle for a while. I mean, the state obviously has much more power. The pamphlets, the um, you know, the the the, the perches, the speeches that in they can when they're declaring them when uh, you, you, the, the criminals in the in in the halls of of uh, parliaments, you know, when they're passing these laws, uh, they're they 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 certainly have the. The, the the highest stage um but as long as the luddites you know had the sympathy of the masses then there's these folk songs and things that are countervailing it but eventually you know the luddites just do get do get crushed and it is important to remember that you know i think there's also some misconception that like well the luddites argument lost like well the luddites said uh you know we should that we should have this mode where people are working in their homes producing cloth with machinery in in their homes and that's just less efficient the market eventually decided that it wants more uh efficient and much cheaper goods and they're willing to tolerate you know a lot a drop in quality that's just what the market decided it, it's not that's not the case at all you know the state had to mobilize tens of thousands of troops they had to forcibly put the luddites down in a hail of gunfire they had to you know they had to hang luddites by the dozen you know in order to make an example of them um and then they had to sort of embark on this propaganda campaign that more or less you know uh, continues to this day uh to sort of cast luddites as uh, as dummies uh, so that, that you know. wasn't by chance that this term right. luddite changes over time yeah no, yeah no not by chance a very uh a repetition from you know you could you could call it propaganda right the from the state has to repeat it over and over and has to sort of even at the even at the famous luddites trial when um the the luddites who participated in that attack against raffold's mill and others uh are, are being tried you know this is the language that they're using as like these backwards poor wretches these these uh you know this the, the misunderstanding they, they know not what they do um and they're sort of minting this very sort of uh this mischaracterization as the one that's going to endure and of course the state wins that case so you could argue it really sort of crystallizes there as they're hanging these men they're the losers they tried to change the course of history they tried to smash what they didn't like and they lost look what happens when you go against technology you lose you get punished you're dumb and you're uh you're not you're just consigned to the dustbin of history this way so i think that is where i argue you know more than anywhere else that like that that luddite really becomes a pejorative 
Um, and then again, you have all these people who have access to the levers of power, the Prince Regent, uh, the Prime Minister, the people who run the conservative newspapers, they uh, who are subsidized by the state at the time. Um, who they Luddite, 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 Luddite. And then from, from then on, you know, it, it's a it's an uphill battle to, to reclaim the term. And, you know, here we are 200 years later. Um, chances are, you know, if you hear somebody called a Luddite, uh, then it's somebody who is either in the tech sector or advocating for new technologies, uh, using it to criticize somebody who um, doesn't like what they're doing uh, to this day. So, yeah, the, the term endures. I, I, I have been focusing on the history of the Luddites, but you do spend significant time in your book, Blood in the Machine, of making parallels and talking about what's happening today. T tell me about that. What, when, when you tell the story, when you research the story of the Luddites, the Luddites, how, how did you, how do you see that story in relations to what we are experiencing today? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> there are a lot, there's, there are a lot and there are almost always a lot, you know, it goes in fits and starts, but I think the conclusion that I draw in, in the book is that so as long as we have this mode of technological development, that is where people with, uh, you know, uh, the most resources and the most power today, you can point to Silicon Valley, where a lot of, of wealth and influence is concentrated in this country. Um, before you might have, uh, you know, pointed to folks who are the Ford or someone who are making the, autom the the mechanized factories in in the Rust Belt and building the automation technologies of the day. Before that, you could point, um, you know, to the factories throughout the Industrial Revolution. But you have people who have access to to power, to influence, to capital, and they get to decide the shape that the technologies will take, and they will be used, and they will be used. Um, <laughs> regardless of whether you know the people who they might affect want them to be used that way so we have this top down um you know sort of profoundly anti-democratic means of producing and deploying technology that has been the norm since the luddites lost so basically luddites were fighting that they were saying we should all have a seat at the table in the way that these technologies are affecting um working people we should you know we should be able to reject certain uses we should be able to you know to sort of try to try to talk out a way that maybe benefits both of us they tried all those things in the run-up to um the Luddite uprising and and the, the the factory owners and the politicians didn't want to listen and today we have quite a profound example of that where silicon valley just has one of the uh, immense concentrations of, of of capital at its disposal um in in all of uh history it can say um Oh, you have this pitch for uh, you know to for disrupting the taxi industry with an app, uh, and you're called Uber. Okay, great. Here is literally hundreds of billions of dollars for you to try to make that a reality. <clears throat> did anybody you know ask for? Did you talk to the ta taxi companies or the taxi workers if, uh, and to see if see how they might feel about that? No. Oh, that's fine. We we get to make the call. We're Silicon Valley. This is the way it's going to be. <clears throat> and so you have something like uh, the gig app economy where you have these companies coming in and saying, uh, we're going to use our venture capital and our bottomless pockets uh, to try to undercut existing businesses so that we can employ more precarious workers to do a very similar job. You know, I think taxis are the best example, but it also applies to delivery workers, uh, you know, carpenters and things like that on, on TaskRabbit that all have to compete with these uh, with the with these apps whose primary innovation is not the fact that there's any there's a great new technology at work here i mean you're just pressing a button on an app what it's basically doing is is is, is arbitrage where it's saying okay you know we're going to do the same job for you but now we can get somebody who signed up for the work on our marketplace and we don't have to pay them the same thing that like a union carpenter or a taxi worker who's been um who's who's protected by rates that are set by the the, the municipality are protected by we get to steamroll all of that because we're an app because we're a technology um and it's very much the same argument that was being made by entrepreneurs 200 years ago um when 
people were coming and saying, hey, you need to, we have laws that govern our trade. You can't just use cloth. You can, can't just staff a child uh, to run this machine and make cloth. We have a, a rule that says you have to apprentice for seven years. And they said, well, it's different this time. We, we have machinery. The machinery is doing it. And lawmakers were all too eager to side with the uh, the te- the the owners of the of, of the factories and the technologies just like today they were all too eager to side with Uber. Um, so while I was writing the book, it, the mo- the neatest parallel was probably this rise of the gig app economy where work was being consigned to these algorithms that were owned and facilitated by Silicon Valley companies um, at the direct expense of, of factory wor- workers of of warehouse workers in the case of Amazon because Amazon's work is precarious and um, you know uh, often distributed by an app if you're a flex driver. Or, um, but uh, it's really crystallized after the book came out, which is in the middle of the upheaval against um, uh, the generative AI and the way that generative AI is affecting creative workers. Um, it's almost a one-to-one parallel where hmm. in the Luddites day, you had cloth workers who had, were skilled workers plying their trades with, you know, again, using the technology in their homes that they were that they had mastered. Today, you have, you know, artists who are applying their trades at home using the latest technologies, uh, you know, with the, you know, their, their, you know, their, their digital pens and digital tools at their disposal. And then generative AI comes along and says, we're going to sell uh, companies, you know, this tool where if they pay 50 bucks a month or whatever it is, then uh, they can have access to uh, a tool that auto generates art auto generates text it's been trained on all of your work in the past and it can just pluck that out and generate a it generate whatever you want and it, it, it'll cost you know one tenth of uh what you, what a, what it would to hire a real artist um and you could do that any number of times you want per month so it's it's not going to be as good but it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be uh it's going to probably be good enough for you know if for corporate use cases or whatever so don't worry about it too much and sure enough it's already impacting um especially artists copywriters translators uh, uh creative laborers basically who many of whom who have i've spoken to have already seen their livelihoods take a major hit and seen the the amount of work that they um are commissioned decline and so you have this parallel you have you have some people who own the technology who are benefiting from this extreme reduction um in in price by offering this automated production of a you know created creative output um and these skilled workers are suffering uh at at, at the hands of open ai mid journey um you know google's gemini all of these all of these uh these new systems um and so that's why you really see uh, a resistance growing among artists and creative workers who are kind of on the warpath against this stuff um in a way that's um you know kind of unusual over the last 20 years we have not it's a relatively new thing for uh you know uh to 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 gain this much purchase in mainstream culture you know people have been resisting and criticizing technology of course for 20 years but it's uh it's really reached a a fever pitch that i haven't seen as in my years as a technology journalist um over the uh, generative ai issue Brian Merchant has been our guest. He has joined us to talk about the history of the Luddites. Brian Merchant is the author of the book, Blood in the Machine, The Origins of the Rebellion Against Big Tech. You can also read his writings online at bloodinthemachine.com. Brian Merchant, that was fascinating. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. This was great.